Hi, this is Jim from Trek World, and today we start out our video by acknowledging just how important something as simple as a chair can truly be. Now, in the hit HBO television series Game of Thrones, they understood what it meant to have power. You see, there were 27 houses, there were seven gods, but there was only one Iron Throne. And sitting on the Iron Throne was strategically important. You can have the largest army, win the most battles, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't have the Iron Throne. So join us after the break as we look at a prop from the original Star Trek series that carries a similar significance to this very day. Please be sure to check out these other popular videos about Season 1 in our series covering Star Trek in the 1960s. And also, please be sure to hit that like button below the video so that YouTube will recommend this video to other folks who have not yet discovered it. If you have photos, videos, or other documents that you would like to submit to us, you can put them into our blind drop box on the web at submit.trek-world.com. Now, in Star Trek, they had their own throne. The captain's chair is something every Star Trek fan is intimately familiar with. On a starship, the captain's chair is sort of like the brain of a central nervous system. From that position, the captain determines what steps to take next based on the inputs that he's received. The symbolism of the captain's chair goes far beyond its mundane function as a piece of furniture to sit on. It is also a sign of respect for those who sit upon it. Enterprise is the first Warp 5 vessel in human history, the pride of the fleet. And you're sitting in a chair they've been using on Warp 2 ships for over a decade. You deserve better. I'm going to build you a throne. Now, although there have been many versions over the decades, this right here, well, that's the chair that started it all. This is the actual chair that Jeffrey Hunter sat in during filming The Cage in late 1964 and was thereafter used by William Shatner through the second pilot and the original TV series run. For the next few minutes, we will take a look at that chair and the various changes that have been done to it during the mid to late 1960s. And along the way, we will look at the iconography, the prestige, and the significance associated with the chair. Now, our favorite chair began its life in the late 1950s as part of the Madison Furniture Company's Dimension 24 collection, produced and sold only through 1962 and 1968 that chair was chosen by Matt Jeffries to be the basis of the captain's chair. Utilizing a black vinyl cushion covering, he stained the wood slightly darker and then encased the entire chair in a console made of plywood. Then the chair was fitted with a spring-loaded swivel on a platform. The result became such a cultural icon that now, almost 60 years later, it is still recognized all over the world, even by folks who were never Star Trek fans. Now, before we go much further, we need to talk about one of the most dramatic differences between The Cage and Where No Man Has Gone Before and the TV series, namely the gooseneck viewer. Now, Rodmary had these things all over the place in The Cage. Basically, just about any console the crew had to operate would have a gooseneck viewer on it. What he didn't consider originally was the amount of optical printing that would be needed each week to insert footage into each episode. Sort of like the way that you see Spock here in the lower left-hand corner as he delivers a line. To make matters worse, no stock footage could be used because every insert would be unique to the script of the show. So here you see two fairly good pictures of the captain's chair in the cage with a gooseneck viewer. Let's do a little digital magic to get a closer look, shall we? But my favorite is this little photo here, because I think it's actually perfect for seeing the initial design of the chair. Note that the chair could swivel, but at this point, it was also at the same height as the helmsman and navigator chairs in front of it. Now, as we move from the Pike era in Star Trek to the Kirk era, let's take a quick look at what Christopher Pike had to coach a young Jim Kirk on in the 2009 Star Trek film pertaining to the responsibility of sitting in that chair. You don't comply with the rules. You don't take responsibility for anything, and you don't respect the chair. You know why? Because you're not ready for it. But Kirk did end up getting his shot at sitting in the captain's chair. 
and by the time a second pilot was ordered, Pike was out and Kirk was in. And Kirk would again pay it forward when he gave his advice to Picard about how important that chair is when it comes to feeling like you can make a difference. You know, maybe this isn't about an empty house. Maybe it's about that empty chair on the bridge of the Enterprise. Ever since I left Starfleet, I haven't made a difference. Going back to the second pilot now, as you can see, the Gooseneck viewer is still on the right arm of the chair for Captain Kirk. No, another change in the scene is the addition of a lettering plaque onto the side of the chair just above where the gooseneck mounts. These engravable signs were very popular on Star Trek, and I actually remember seeing them in corporate America right up until Y2K. However, we had a slight problem when Shatner would sit in the captain's chair. You see, Bill Shatner was only 5 foot 9 inches tall at his peak which was three inches shorter than Jeffrey Hunter. So to hide the height difference between Shatner and the two actors in front of him, they put the chair now on a platform. When it came time to begin filming the TV episodes, they decided to remove the gooseneck viewer entirely, instead opting to put a media reader and speaker on the right arm to compensate for the loss of the video intercom system. These two photos of the captain's chair during the actual series run do a pretty good job of showing off that platform height boost that they gave to Shatner's captain's chair. The captain's chair in Star Trek was far more than a symbol of strategic importance. It was also a privilege to be able to be seated in it. As you can see here in this clip from Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, where Captain Stiles of the Excelsior warns Kirk that his actions could result in him never sitting in the chair again. Kirk, you do this, you'll never sit in the captain's chair again. Finally, this overhead shot gives a brilliant photo of both of the control panels in the arms. Additionally, we have a shot of the added detail menu stickers and unique screenshot from Court Martial. Now, I gotta really speak to this. At first, I thought it was somewhat dated that you would see that those stickers were literally labels that were printed out. But I do have to admit, today, 60 years later, we still use labels that look like that. So I guess people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Finally, a rare image in the bottom right-hand corner which shows the chair from the dead center of the stage, but from the behind. Now, since the original captain's chair was built for the original series, there have been a multitude of captain's chairs on which various ships of each of the TV series spinoffs have taken place. Here you see just a few of them having been used not only in the TV shows, but in the film adaptations as well. Notice the captain's chair in the bottom right from the J.J. Abrams 2009 Star Trek reboot. Of course, I did edit out all of the lens flares. All of us have learned in life as we get older that change is always inevitable. In this particular case, Kirk's captain's chair changed several times during the making of the first original Star Trek films. Apparently, while change may be inevitable, it is not always a welcome change for the better, as Kirk confides with McCoy in this scene from Star Trek V. What's the matter, Jim? I miss my old chair. <laughs> That's okay, Jim. Your chair misses the old Captain Kirk. Now, when the series ended, Paramount dismantled sets in late 1969 in preparation for just scrapping everything. However, the captain's chair was rescued, or taken, which way you look at it, by an unnamed individual and turned up much later in the 2002 Profiles in History collection from Bob Justman. It sold for $304,750, the largest single price ever on an item from the original Star Trek television series. Here you can see where the actual chair has been, since it was subsequently placed in Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen's Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, Washington. Now, a funny thing about captain's chairs is that in Star Trek, there is a mystique associated with sitting in them. Obviously for characters on the show, but also amongst visitors and co-workers visiting the sets where the TV shows are filmed. Every one of these captains would be fiercely protective of his chair, but it would take almost 60 years for a situation to arrive where a captain would be shown on screen commenting about it. On screen. I'm only going to tell you this once. Get the hell out of my chair. 
our newest, perhaps oldest captain, Christopher Pike, played by the incredible Anson Mount, holds no punches as he confronts someone who is where they should not be. Please be sure to check out these other popular videos about Season 1 on our series covering Star Trek in the 1960s. And also, please be sure to hit that like button below the video so that YouTube will recommend this video to other folks who have not yet discovered it. However, if there is only one video that you watch at all today on YouTube, I recommend this one.